for management webinar. Um, if this is your uh, first time attending a webinar with us, welcome. I hope you find the uh, experience to be uh, educational and uh, hopefully somewhat entertaining as well as uh, you know, valuable to you as well. Um, we, uh, if it is not your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome back. I'm glad you had a good enough experience at a uh, past one that it prompted you to want to attend again. Uh, my name is Brandon Gallagher-Watson. I am the creative director these days for the Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements and Rainbow uh, Tree Care Services Company. Um, and today we're going to be talking about, us about Emerald Ash Borer, which amazingly enough, even though we've been talking about Emerald Ash Borer for well over 10 years here now, it still is by far and away our most popular topic. Just looking at how many people registered for today's webinar, uh, it's amazing of how uh, Emerald Ash Borer still manages to uh, to to grab headlines and get attention, and for all the reasons we'll go through in this uh, presentation, I hope. Our uh, bit of housekeeping nuggets here. Uh, this webinar is worth one CEU. If you did not put your uh, ISA certification number into the uh, box at registration, simply enter it now into the questions box. Uh, that allows it to be nice and uh, easy for us to find later. Um, during this presentation, let me close my little thing here. Um, during this presentation, uh, I will actually not be paying attention to the questions, but my uh, lovely sidekick producer, Peter Vu here, will actually be looking at the questions. And what we'll do is, if there's really a question that's timely, um, he'll interrupt me and we'll, we'll cover it then. Other than that, we will uh, be uh, addressing the uh, webinar, or sorry, the questions at the end of the webinar. And note the last point, this webinar is being recorded, and shortly after this, we will have it uploaded to the YouTubes of the world. So if there's other people you would like to uh, have view this webinar, it'll be available for your uh, consumption there later. So uh, with that, we'll uh, jump right into it. Well, actually, I'm going to first jump into something else. I'm going to make a quick plug for a project that Rainbow is trying to get behind called Saluting Branches. You may or may not have heard of this yet. But basically what we are doing is doing a national day of service of um, volunteering tree care work at national cemeteries. So it's a project that Rainbow Tree Care had been doing for a couple of years with other members of the Minnesota Society of Arboriculture at Fort Snelling here in the Twin Cities. And we were looking for a service project to get behind that we could do nationally. And based on the success of, of what we had done at Fort Snelling, we really thought this could be a project that could be a nationwide event. So we started talking with the Department of Veteran Affairs, who are the ones who manage all these national cemeteries, and uh, they jumped at the opportunity and they really helped us identify which of the cemeteries across the country uh, would be good ones for arborists to volunteer at. So as you can see, the first one is coming up this September, September 23rd. And you might ask, why would you even want to participate in something like this? Um, you know, one thing we really found after talking to the Department of Veteran Affairs, there really was a need for this. There's very few of these national cemeteries actually have professional arborists regularly coming in and inspecting the trees and doing regular tree care on them. And these sites are visited by millions of visitors, you know, visiting these uh, the, the final resting places of these, uh, of these veterans. So we really felt this is a program that, like I said, there was a need for out in the, in the, um, um, at these cemeteries. We also found, because it's a project that we did with other companies, this was really a great day of service where you got to also work alongside other arborists who every other day of the year are our competitors or just guys you would never, you never get the opportunity to work with. So the, the people who have participated in these uh, um, uh, service days at veteran cemeteries have found them to be a, a great bonding experience and a great way to get to know other arborists in your market. We're also looking to make this a bit of a media campaign as well, helping raise awareness about not only the good work that arborists do for things in the community um, like this, but also what, what, what does a professional arborist do? What, what value do they bring and, and why should you be looking at um, uh, working with professional arborists? So we're looking at making this event something that will have some, um, some national and local media attention as well. And also, you know, frankly, it's, it's a good cause. It's something that, um, you know, we can all get behind, you know, when you look at the, the, the service that the, uh, the veterans put out there and what we can do to help make those, um, their, uh, their, their, uh, their grounds safe and beautiful for their visitors, you know, is something that, you know, has really touched a lot of the, the folks that we've talked to. You know, we have really talked to you know, a ton of different arborists about this, and basically everyone we've, we've, we've spoken to about this, it's been a, a, a positive response, as, as you can imagine. Hang on, my little 
go to webinar thing keeps popping up. Um, you know, what kind of work can we be doing? Um, really, it's everything in our border culture. So everything from, you know, if you have a rake, we could use your help. If you can climb trees, we could use your help. If you're a plant healthcare specialist or you do GIS, these are all the type of things that we could use uh, help for. So where is this happening? Um, you can see um, um, we're doing 22 different locations across the country. Uh, so if any of those are close to you and this is a project that, that speaks to you and you think you or um, anyone at your company would, um, um, would be happy to participate in, we would absolutely love to, uh, to hear from you. So, um, you know, you can be a volunteer. We're also looking for site leaders, which is someone who would show up at the site a couple weeks before the September 23rd event and help identify the scope of the tree work that will be performed that day. So, you know, again, um, you don't need to volunteer your entire staff, but if you have a crew or two, you could donate. Uh, it is a good cause, and I think it would be something that would be uh, uh, rewarding for you. So there you go. Check out salutingbranches.org uh, if that's something you would like to uh, know more about. You can also check us out on the old Facebook there. So. <clears throat> Enough of that. Now let's hop into what you guys uh, attended uh, today's webinar for is emerald ash borer. And you know, a lot of the conversation about emerald ash borer always sort of happens at this macro scale. You know, you hear about millions of trees are dead in Michigan, and, and you know, thousands of communities are affected by this, and the city is removing thousands of trees this year. Well, a lot of the conversation about emerald ash borer sort of happens at this level. And you know, part of the reason emerald ash borer is such a big deal is just the sheer number of ash tree um, proportions in a lot of these urban forests. But, but when we're talking about emerald ash borer management, very little of it happens at this level, right? There's no um, tree care treatment that we fly over the city and spray on trees to protect them. There's no way to, in mass, remove thousands of ash trees. So emerald ash borer management really does happen at the individual tree level. Right, so um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is is really how to be thinking about one tree at a time in a forest of thousands and thousands of these ash trees. Uh, quick background on us for those who have not attended a a, a presentation through us before. Um, you know. We're speaking here from Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements, which is the research and development branch of Rainbow Tree Care. Rainbow Tree Care has been around uh, in Minnesota as a tree care company, started with Dutch elm disease in the late 70s. Uh, you can see as we've grown over the years, we've added a lawn care company, a pest control service. Uh, we're now an employee-owned company. You can kind of see the size and scope of our company by our numbers there. And you know, really the take home is that you know, about a third of our company are, is made up of certified arborists. And within that, you know, a number of those are, are, are board certified master arborists. We are um, a, always speaking from this position of knowing what it's like running an everyday tree care service company. And then also what we know from our, our research and development division is basically focused on how do we develop protocols and tools for arborists to, to use in the field for the service of saving trees and also um, uh, because we always have that background in commercial tree care, we also understand how um, marketing and branding and conversations with customers are as big of a factor in, in tree health care as the, the scientific protocols are. So a lot of what we do from a research standpoint is developing protocols that really speak to how a homeowner would actually take care of their tree or how a arborist applicator at the base of the tree would be performing a service. So, you know, our commitment to the industry, both, you know, internally inside of our company, uh, we have this commitment to our employees, and we also have this commitment to, to professional arborists around the country, is we exist solely to advance the science of tree health care. Our company of scientific advancements developed directly because the owner of our tree care company saw a lack of quality um, um, protocols and products for, for taking care of trees that were not backed by science. So we literally started a, a scientific branch solely to, um, to help for, um, you know, further the, the entire industry in science and plant health care. Uh, I myself, I've been with Rainbow for, I'm going into my 10th year. I started here as a um, research associate, uh, but because I had an art and design background, I ended up getting to move into more of a creative role as time went on, but I'm still heavily involved in what we do with, with research around here. Um, today, our outcomes are going to be understanding when are treatments appropriate. Our message is absolutely not 
every tree that's an ash tree should be treated with an insecticide to protect it from emerald ash borer. And hopefully you'll, you'll understand how we make that decision at the end of this. Uh, then we'll understand which of the treatment options there are out there. And then we're also going to get into a lot of the research that we've been doing and kind of show you guys how we develop these tools and protocols out in the field uh, and, and why we're as confident as we are in the different performances that they'll provide. Uh, as I said, I've been with the company since 2005. We started in Emerald Ash Borer research even earlier than that. Uh, Emerald Ash Borer was really positively identified in about 2002, and we started doing research in about 2004 on it, once it was sort of determined that this insect was spreading and becoming a, a bigger issue than just a regional problem in Michigan. Over that time, you can see we've done um, about two dozen long-term multi-year trials. We have looked at um, over a dozen different technologies, and out of all those, we've looked at around 60 different experimental treatments, if you don't count all the untreated treats that we've done. So we've looked at everything from uh, which chemistries are most effective, what rates of those chemistries are most effective, which application methods are most effective, and um, probably most critical, what the application timing and how that factors into uh, the predictable nature of, of our treatments here. So we're, we're pretty well steeped in, in, in emerald ash borer to say the least. I was telling Peter before this talk, I bet I'd probably be given 50 talks in, in 10 years on emerald ash borer and it always is well attended and it's always a, 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 an area of interest. Um, so uh, emerald ash borer, even though there's sometimes it can feel like it's the, um, you know, it's, the media cares more about it than any other issue. As we go through this, we'll definitely start to understand why it's a, uh, you know, such a hot topic still. These are a, a, a smattering of different organizations that we've done our research with, um, anything from municipalities, uh, I can say arboretums, professional uh, tree care companies, as well as universities and government agencies. So um, the, the, the research partners we've, um, we've been able to partner with for, for Emerald Ash Borer Research have really been critical in, in helping further the science of, of management for this insect. And really, this photo kind of helps capture why you know, emerald ash borer is such a big deal is, you know, it isn't just that trees die because of an insect problem. Trees die from insect problems every day. Part of the issue of emerald ash borer is these trees die fairly rapidly. And then you combine this with the sheer number of trees that some of these municipalities have or any of these markets have with, with, um, uh, with ash. That's really why this is such a big deal. You know, insects die from trees. That's not uncommon. This many trees dying from an insect problem uh, really is why emerald ash borer is sort of in a class of its own. Because of the sheer population of, of ash, you'll see this talked about a lot in, in emerald ash borer, the, you know, the exponential death curve, right? Where you go from uh, hundreds of trees to, to tens of thousands of trees fairly quickly. Um, because we know in this model, this is not just a theoretical model, this has been the, the, the experience in just about every market where emerald ash borer has, has appeared is over time, you go from, it doesn't seem that big of a deal, it seems like, you know, oh, there's some trees going down, oh, we're starting to find in this neighborhood, to an explosion occurs where it goes from hundreds of thousands to millions in, in a fairly short period of time. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about with management is not about how to stop the, the progression of a curve like this, right? That you can't. There is no eradication program for, for animal ash borer. So a lot of our management is, like I said, focused on individual trees at a time, and then how can that translate into uh, maybe a flattening of this curve, or at least a, an extension out of this curve, so you don't run into going from, we had to remove 700 trees this year, to we have to remove 7,000 trees next year. You know, um, one thing that I was told in, by a, a nursery owner in Ohio a few years ago was, Three years ago, I couldn't sell a single emerald ash borer treatment because it was too early. Three years later, I can't sell a single emerald ash borer treatment because it's too late. And it sounds apocryphal, but that's really the, the, the situation. I mean, look at the two photos here from 2009 to 2011. Uh, in, you know, this is um, Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was discovered there in 2006. By 2009, the mentality was, well, right, I mean, it, it's here, but it's not like it was in those other neighborhoods where, you know, trees were dying in mass. And, you know, trying to get people in action in 2009 was, was, was challenging, to say the least. And then you look at the impact just two years later by, by taking no action on these. And now they went from, 
you know, like I said, to a, a problem that was too early to a problem that was now too late. And because of the, you know, like I had said, Emerald Ash Borer is, is a, a issue beyond urban forestry simply because of the sheer number of ash trees. You know, we have impacts that are are far greater than just the loss of a few trees. You know, I said many times that if this was the um, um, emerald catalpa borer, we would not be talking about this because there's not enough catalpa trees in an urban forest to, to have an impact all these things beyond just a forestry problem, right? Well, emerald ash borer affects everything from the, you know, the budgets uh, for, for municipalities to the environmental impacts. We'll see some of those later of the sort of um, domino effect of, of the loss of these trees. The loss of these trees links to, you know, the, you know, all these standing dead trees. Ash trees are notoriously brittle once they die. So it becomes a public safety issue. This isn't, well, we've got a thousand trees and we've got ten years to get them down. No, we've got a thousand dead trees. We've got a, a few months to get them down before they could be a, 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 a public safety issue. And, you know, all of this translates into political issues as well because anything that's affecting this many different aspects of, of a municipality um, absolutely impact the way that uh, 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 politicians, uh, funding, all these other aspects um, are, are impacted by emerald ash borer. So what do we do about emerald ash borer? Well, of course, we do have treatments for trees that we'll get into in a minute, but, you know, emerald ash borer like, is an issue because of the high proportion of one genus of, of trees in, in an urban forest. So emerald ash borer is a great opportunity to sort of you know, balance out the the, the the census, if you will. You know, m and ash board because of funding issues, because of or, or funding opportunities, because of public awareness opportunities, it's a great opportunity to get rid of a lot of these trees that are lower quality trees, trees that are in poor sites, trees that are, um, you know, under power lines, all these other type of, of planting situations that are are not ideal for ash to be growing in anyhow, this is a great opportunity, and a lot of municipalities are jumping on this as, you know, like I was just on a bike ride with my wife around the Minneapolis Chain Lakes this weekend, and we noticed probably 250 ash trees removed, yet they had done so in a way where it didn't feel like the neighborhood had been clear-cut. They just kind of realized, you know, you know, six out of ten trees around our lake are all ash. Let's start thinning this out now so we don't have a problem where all of a sudden we lose 60% of our trees in one year. You know, they're doing it wisely where they're, they're removing some and replanting as it goes so that way the, you know, the visual impact isn't as, as dramatic. But uh, Emerald Ash Borer, like I said, has been a, a, a great reason for, um, for foresters and commercial arborists to get out there and, you know, have conversations about removing trees that are not in ideal situations. There are trees, of course, that are in good situations or do have value or are pro producing um, benefits to the community, those trees are valuable and, and do have a, uh, um, a, a reason to, to, um, to, to be protected. You know, these are ones that are, you know, in um, urban situations where they're providing all the benefits that urban trees provide, you know, from, you know, energy savings to, um, you know, water savings to the, you know, aesthetic value of shade, all these other um, uh, things that uh, we get the benefits from an urban forest. Um, you know, there are lots of, of reasons why a tree should be protected. Another one is, you know, this last one here, you're not sort of every tree that gets protected doesn't have to live in a world where you're protecting them in perpetuity. You know, this doesn't have to be, well, if I chose to treat this tree in 2015, my goal is to have this tree around in 2050. Uh, a lot of, um, especially the, the larger scale management, is focused on how can we treat enough trees to ensure that we're not going to get stuck one year with that population explosion and all of a sudden having to take down more trees in a season than we're equipped to be able to do. So um, um, treatments have, have moved into a different role with a lot of these um, uh, sort of um, forest management um, ideas where it's, again, no longer about how can I protect this tree from this deadly disease, it's our deadly insect, how can I protect this tree so I can remove it on my terms as opposed to on, on the terms of, um, of, of the tree and the insect. <clears throat> How we make our management decisions for Emerald Ash Borer, we, we look to this document a lot. It was produced a few years ago. It's sort of widely known as the multi-state fact sheet. Um, you can see it's now in its second edition. It's been updated. Um, it was put out by a, a, a combination of, of five different um, uh, universities. And the reason this came out is Emerald Ash Borer became, you know, not only a, you know, a, a 
political and, uh, and, and media sensation. It's also, of course, a marketing opportunity for lots of different companies trying to sell treatments. And we were sort of back to where we were 30 years ago with plant health care of somebody just putting a product out there and saying that it worked and or in dosages and just saying that it worked. So what these guys did was they looked at the available information out there and basically made kind of a, you know, quote unquote, official recommendations of, of what treatments are effective, what, um, what application methods and, and other sort of guidelines about how to effectively use insecticides for, for, um, for ash trees. So like I said, this is really the guide that, that we work from and it really set out you know, the, the, the reason we sort of recommend the three chemistries we recommend of imidacloprid, emimectin, benzoate, and dinotefuron is this is what was, what was in the document. Um, there are other, you know, insecticides that, that will absolutely work on an ash borer. Um, you know, a good example would be something like a, a, like a bifenthrin. If you spray a tree with bifenthrin, it absolutely will affect amyl ash borer. But there's all these other factors in bifenthrin of, well, it's a spray and it's, a, um, you know, it's got all these other issues with it that don't make it an effective way to, to manage uh, emerald ash borer. So this guide wasn't just what products are out there that work on emerald ash borer. This guide was put together of what are the most effective, cost effective, um, public safety, all the other things that factor into our decision making on, on emerald ash borer. Um, like I said, we use this guide as sort of our reference for it. This guide also helped establish this idea of a, a, a canopy condition rating, right? We do know that trees at a certain point become, you know, basically too declined to, 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 to be saved. Well, where is that threshold? So this guide helps sort of um, develop a, um, a, a visual guide, if you will, to, to what canopy thinness decline looks like. And we really use that 30% mark a uh, 30% decline, so here's 0% decline to 30% decline. Trees that look like this are still, um, you know, recoverable from an last borer infestation. As you start getting further away from that 30% decline, you start getting uh, a lower and lower probability of being able to pull that tree back from the brink. So in, in practical nature, this is basically what I just said, is we're looking for um, uh, trees, if we are looking for, um, you know, trees in, um, that are infested, uh, we do sort of use that, you know, like, I'm sorry, your tree is basically too declined, it's really not worth it, now's a good time to look at uh, removing and replacing this tree, um, because you can kind of see how it goes pretty quickly from, uh, you know, 30% canopy decline still looks like a pretty full ash canopy. So once I said, like, once you start getting past that, then your, uh, your chances of success uh, go down significantly. So, you know, the take home message here is, you know, the classic, uh, you know, an um, ounce of prevention worth the pound of cure. You have a lot more options uh, when a tree is still healthy and not infested to protect it, um, you know, successfully from an ash borer than you do in higher pressure areas or once the tree is already starting to decline from, from an infestation. So the next question we always get is, well, when should I start treatments, right? How close is close enough to, to um, you know, be realistically starting treatments here? Um, the, uh, you know, official, um, you know, most state agencies use, it depends on the state you're in, 15 or 25 miles from a nearest infested tree is, is sort of determined you're in the risk area enough that it's warranted to start treatments. I was just at a talk last week in South Dakota, which does not yet have m one ash borer, and this was definitely the question was, well, should we be treating yet? And it's like, well, it's literally nowhere within 200 miles of where you're at, so you're well beyond the 25-mile range. But we here in the Twin Cities, everything in the Twin Cities is within 15 miles of a known infested tree. So when, can, when should we be starting treatment? Should every ash tree in the Twin Cities now be under protection? And well, not really. You know, there's um, the decision making on, on, on which trees, you know, that's going to really come down to the individual tree, the, the client. You know, a, um, a, a neighbor of my, my wife's parents has an ash tree in her backyard, and while a, uh, ash borer has not been found in St. Louis Park, the city that I live in yet, this neighbor has been treating her tree since it was found in 2009 because her mentality was, well, I'm not going to wait until my neighbor's tree has this for me to make to have it, and I also know this bug pops up everywhere, so I want to make sure it's not my tree that it's popping up in. 
So we have trees that are customer trees that are, that are you know, far enough away that we would probably say, you know, you're really not at risk for this, but the customer's mentality is, yep, and I want to make sure I'm not at risk for this. You know, I mean, it's really no different than, you know, the mentality of taking vaccines uh, for, you know, preventive treatment for, for health problems is, I don't want to wait until my neighbor has measles to take my measles shot. I can take measles shot and prevent myself from getting it. In a way, that's kind of some of the decision making we use with Emerald Ash Borer is if you're within a certain zone and you want to protect that tree, we absolutely recommend treatment. If you're sort of this next buffer zone out, then we have a conversation about the, the, the costs and benefits to you and which treatment we might recommend might, be, uh, might differ based upon uh, where that tree is located in proximity to the nearest known infestation. But that's the big question is, where is the nearest known infestation is, well, it could kind of be anywhere because of stuff like this, right? That here in the, the Twin Cities, it was discovered right in the heart of, uh, of, literally in the heart of the Twin Cities, the same day that all the people from the Department of Agriculture were on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border looking for it there, figuring if it's going to come into Minnesota, we're going to be looking for it here on the edge. And they were literally scouting trees along the St. Croix River Valley the day that it was discovered 75 miles further west in the heart of the cities because it was probably moved there by, by some human activity. So, you know, this is the, the, the unknown X factor of, of ash borer management is, where is it? Well, we don't often know because, as we'll see in a second, this problem is not easy to find the very first year that it, that it uh, enters your market. These trees right there, over a rainbow tree care truck there, uh, are the first trees that ash borer was discovered in Minnesota. So you can see by the date, we got May of 2009, and I can actually remember Chris Nacelli, who's our commercial services arborist, this is a, a, a condo complex here, so he was working with the site there. He's looking at these ash trees going like, these just don't look good, but they don't look like, we were told emerald ash borer symptoms would always have sucker sprouts and woodpecker damage and all this other kind of stuff, so he's going, they look thin, you know, if we look at the, you know, the, the, the thinness chart, I mean, they're, they're somewhere on there, but they don't look like, again, we were told we would see these kind of symptoms, right, where it would be suckering out of the trunk and, you know, dead trees everywhere kind of thing. Well, this really looks more like maybe these trees, you know, something between the 50 and 70 percent declined. No suckers on these at all. And I remember him walking in with this branch sample and asking if I knew where Sean Burnick, our research director, was at. And I go, where did you get those uh, branches? He's like, I just got them in St. Paul. It looks like Emerald Ash Borer. And I'm like, no way, it's not here yet. You know, I mean, it's nowhere even close to here. And within, you know, 24 hours, we were on the uh, uh, media circus uh, <laughs> uh, tour uh, with all of a sudden being the ones who discovered them on Ash Borer in a market where it hadn't been found yet. And it was a, a real big deal. And we were um, inundated with calls and inundated with questions and you know again you look at these trees and this didn't look like the, the the typical symptoms we were sort of warned about so these days when I'm trying to diagnose emerald ash borer in the field I look for these type of canopies you look for this thinner canopy I did the whole sucker sprout thing doesn't occur anymore because we, these trees don't stand dead long enough or you know declined long enough where, where we see much of the suckering in, in cities so, you know, if it's not in your market yet, you know, this is the kind of stuff to be looking for. Um, it's really not that dramatic of, of symptoms, especially when you compare, well, a lot of ash trees don't look that good. Um, and, you know, when I was saying how this is part of the difficulty of this insect pest is knowing where the heck this thing is, you can see the, the timestamp here. This was taking four days after the initial uh, discovery. What you can see here is multiple, um, you know, um, uh, rings of the tree uh, that have um, uh, uh, visible larval galleries in there. You can see at least three years worth of, of galleries in this tree before the tree had declined to the point that, uh, a, you know, a highly trained arborist even took note of this tree. So he, you know, he's, he's been at this site, he was at this site in 2006. Well, we know from dissecting these trees, these trees were infested in 2006, and there was nothing about this tree that would have told him in 2006 we should be concerned, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the discovery of this pest always happens after the fact, right? Nobody ever finds the very first one that ever lands on a tree. So this sort of goes to that, you know, treating trees within 15 miles of the known infested tree. That known infested tree might not be anywhere close to the closest infested tree. And, you know, here's the other, here's this neighborhood 
the day, you know, this is the weekend that we, we you can see the guy like trying to take pictures of the uh, boreholes on the uh, exit holes on the trunk here. Well, here's the same picture of the same neighborhood um, like three months later. And, you know, this, when we were kind of talking earlier about the impact of emerald ash borer, it's so much further beyond just, well, some trees had to come down. You know, a lot of municipalities have had tremendous strains on their municipal water supply because it turns out the loss of a third of the trees in your community uh, expose a whole lot more turf to, to the sun during, during the summer, prompting a lot more homeowners to run their sprinkler systems and put a drain on the municipal water supply to the point they actually had to raise the, the water price to the, to, the, the, um, to the community to help cover the, the, the extra cost for it. So Emil and Ashbor, because of the, you know, the, you know, the, the, they're so common that the loss of these trees really changes the look and feel of these neighborhoods. And, you, know, you might notice, you know, the for sale signs popping up. You know, I mean, and when Ashmore moves in, people are moving out. Okay, probably not directly related, but you know, obviously we do know an impact of of, of tree canopy on property value and things. And and when Ashmore is no different, it absolutely has an impact on the economics of these neighborhoods. Uh, in, when do we treat for emerald ash borer? Uh, this really kind of goes, you know, directly into why we offer multiple treatment options for emerald ash borer. Is you'll notice when you look at the bars down there, the the red is basically an optimal application time for the um, for peak performance. There is no product that covers from you know that covers 12 months of being the best product for our application. What we're trying to do is get the peak of amount of insecticide into the xylem during the time that they're feeding most heavily, which is going to be in late summer into early fall. So our goal with all these different products is basically trying to get the most amount of insecticide into the plant right here during the time that these larvae are feeding. Uh, none of these treatments are um, repellents, right? The, you don't apply Zytec to a tree and now the, an adult won't land on it. Uh, how these work is they, you know, the insecticide is being translocated around in the xylem by the tree. A boar egg hatches, the larvae start to feed, and as they feed, they come in contact with the treatment, stop feeding, and die, right? So, um, so all of these um, uh, products still actually have the, the insect inside the, the, the tree for them to be effective. And then it's once they consume the product that they... Um, that the product really starts to work, right? So that's an important thing when we talk later about the impact of high pressure on the effectiveness of these, um, you know, of these uh, treatments. I was telling someone last week that if you figure, even if you had, um, if you had a, a great insecticide inside the tree, but you had such a high insect pressure that all these insects are landing on the tree at the same time, you might have a thousand eggs hatch, and those thousand eggs might only consume an inch of, of tree material before they consume enough of the insecticide to die, but now you've still got 1,000 inches worth of, worth of trails inside the tree that have now been compromised. So even if the products are working in really high pressure areas, we still might actually see some impact, and we'll, we'll actually see some of those in some photos in a little bit. Um, so. Now we're kind of getting into, you know, on the ground, how are we actually applying these treatments? We just said there's three main chemistries that we use. You can kind of see by, by the, the listings under the red there which products are applied by which type of application method. And this is a big question is, what's the best application method? Well, if you talk to a company that only sells tree injection equipment, guess what they think the best treatment is? probably tree injection. If you work with a company that doesn't sell any tree injection equipment, they'll probably say tree injection is overhyped and damages the tree and you don't want to use that. So we, because we do both, we, you know, we make soil applied products, we make tree injection products, we also have a, you know, a, a service company where we're out there trying to apply these. You know, to us, the, the which is the best is determined by those sort of four questions right there. If you already own tree injection equipment, yeah, tree injection might be a great uh, option for you. If you do not, then maybe investing in a bunch of equipment the first year is, is not the best application method. Um, you know, that second bullet point of uh, what kind of ember ash borer pressure are we talking about, that's going to be a big factor in which products are going to perform best. That third one is probably a, even a bigger factor of, of when is this treatment going to be performed. As we showed earlier with that slide of the treatment um, uh, timing, that becomes a big factor of why we want to offer as many different tools in the toolbox as possible is to help um, uh, cover all those gaps and no matter what time we're going out to consult a customer, um, you know, we have a, a, a 
you know, a, a, a bullet in the chamber, if you will, that can, um, that, can, that can effectively protect no matter what time of year we're going to go out there and try to do a treatment. And that fourth one of, you know, political concerns and budget aren't just at that municipal level. You know, there's lots of homeowners that would, you know, you know for whatever reason, you know, they're absolutely adamant they don't want tree injection because of, you know, whatever reason. So um, there's also reasons, that, you know, the number four sort of gets into, there are reasons that are not always just science-based about why we have a, you know, the, the best treatment in the toolkit, if you will. So all of these factor into um, which treatment for which tree at which time of year, um, is the best. Uh, let's go into a little bit about how these products are applied and just show a little bit of detail. If we look at our, our soil applied treatments, um, primarily, you know, there's actually, again, multiple products we, we can use for soil application. Zytex is the product that we, um, that we do apply. Um, it is an, a medical open product, and um, the device that the guy is using there is actually a soil injector probe that uh, Rainbow invented a few years ago called the HTI, and it basically works like a um, like a syringe needle that inside that little green box here, there's a chamber. It's a 250 mil chamber. So the applicator uses a chart that'll say how many shots for a tree of, of this size. And he evenly goes around the tree injecting 250 mil shots into the soil. And then a little counter keeps track. So it's quite accurate and it's quite fast application. So um, a lot of the treatments we do are, are still soil applications. Um, you can see the information about the rates there. We'll actually get into a second here how um, Zytec actually is a product that we, um, that we did quite a bit of research on um, to, to, to bring up uh, soil applications really into the fold. When Emerald Ash Borer really started taking off, it was noted that these soil applications were not holding up under higher pressure. So we were interested in, in why. Why did it seem to be working on smaller trees in, in lower infested areas, yet sort of broke down on larger trees and in, in higher infested areas. So um, oops, quick slide there is the reason we apply right around the base of the tree is the high concentration of fibrous roots right at the base of the tree. Here's a slide sort of showing that um, um, some of the research that we did on, you can see these are good sized mature ash trees in Toledo, Ohio. Um, this trial was started in 2006 and you can really see where the, um, the, the insect population boom occurred. Remember we're talking about our exponential death curve? Look how this white line of our untreated trees follows exactly an exponential death curve, right? Um, and this is also kind of why we use that 30% or less as a parameter of saying at a certain point the tree is too infested and, and the chances of success go down quite a bit. But when we started looking at why were soil applications breaking down? We started wondering if it was a timing issue or was it a dosage issue? So we looked at setting up trials that looked at both of these. So where it says Merit 1X, the 1X would be what had at the time was sort of the industry standard um, uh, application rate for soil applied imidacloprid. And then we looked at what if we doubled that rate? So when it says Zytec 2X, you can follow that line. Um, those are the, um, the uh, the double that standard treatment. So what we found was as time went on, at first there wasn't much of a difference between any of these treatments. And then as the insect population built, you really started seeing this spread happening between the, um, the untreated trees and even these trees that were being treated at either a lower rate or trees that were being treated at a different time of the year. Um, we did find that spring treatments really were more effective with imidacloprid because, again, we we're looking at trying to get the peak of abundance insecticide into the plant by about August. So if you apply um, imidacloprid in the spring, enough of it's up there later in the year. We found if you apply at that same rate in the fall time, not enough of it was in the tree by the following year at the peak time. And the same thing with, with both products. This is just comparing the, the two brand names. And you can see we found exactly the same results pretty much with the, with the two of those. Um, now, if we look at our higher rates or our spring applications, you know, this is really where um, you can see even during the time where it got to a, a, a real peak infestation level, once it sort of went through that wave, now you can actually see these trees recovering. And this study, um, I'll show you here, this is what some of the trees in this study look like. And what's really kind of interesting is this study started as just a, a, a rate and timing study. Well, it's kind of transitioned its, its purpose from being a, a rate and, um, and timing study to now it's kind of being a, well, how long past the initial, you know, crest of the wave of a ash borer population explosion, 
what's the impact on these treatments going forward? Do the trees fully recover? Do now, do we have a, um, you know, are the insect populations going to get down to a background level where maybe we don't even have to concern ourselves with treating these trees or maybe we can change the rate or the treatment options for them? So um, this, uh, this site was a, effectively called Zytec Island by uh, Dan Hearns from Ohio State because literally any tree that was not a treated tree in this study is now gone. So literally the only trees left in this entire um, community are ash, or the only ash trees I should say left in this entire community are ones that were part of this, this study. And you can really start to see why, you know, this was applied in the spring and why we really realized oh, that gave us the best results. Here is the same um, timing, but with just that half rate. And it's hard to see from this 2011 picture, but this tree starts to thin out pretty significantly over the next few years. And the ones that were treated in the fall didn't nearly have enough um, uh, treatment left in them to effectively fight off the uh, infestation that year. So like I said, it's kind of interesting to see how these long-term studies sort of change their, you know, their, their purpose over time. Um, and um, so we're absolutely going to keep following this to kind of answer that next question, which is, well, how long do they have to be treated for? What happens 10 years after the infestation is sort of peaked and petered out? So that's what the, uh, the, the next round of, of inquiry into this site will be. Uh, let's look at the next uh, treatment option um, on our uh, list. And Dinotefuron, which is under our brand name of TransTech, you can see it does have uh, a soil injection application on it. Primarily, if we're using Dinotefuron, we're not doing soil applications with it. This is really the application method we'll use, uh, which is this bark spray. So Dinotefuron is a close cousin of imidacloprid, but it's significantly more water soluble. And that translates into a systemic ability that the other products don't have. So we can actually spray this product just the lower bowl of the trunk. You can see we're only going up to about four and a half feet. And you probably can't see me waving my hand at the screen, but trust me, I am. Um, so we spray the, the, the trunk of the tree, and then basically the product absorbs through the lenticels into the vascular system and is then translocated around the tree. So you might be thinking, well, if you're right there by the tree, why is spraying this tree any faster than doing a soil application would have been? Well, it really comes into uh, large properties or um, a site, say, like a golf course, where we can now send an applicator down with a backpack and um, the, the proper mix of, of uh, TransTech, and he can treat an entire, an entire fairway worth of ash trees in 10 minutes, as opposed to how much longer that would take by soil injection or, or, or basal drench. So, um, there is a, a cost difference between imidacloprid and dinotefuron here. And so if we're just doing soil applications of the two, there's really no good reason why dinotefuron applied you know, this way would have been a cheaper option. But if you start factoring labor costs into it, and all of a sudden I can get um, a significantly lower labor cost, still get the trees treated, but get it done in a much faster way with, with fewer applicators, that's really where you know, dinotefuron really plays a major role in some of this large scale management that we do with, with Amal Dash 4. Uh, when I was saying the, here's a visual example of when I was talking about the, the systemic ability of, of um, dinotefuron versus imidacloprid, the red bars there are dinotefuron or transtect, and the yellow would be our Zytec products. And you can basically see what we're measuring here is how much of the product per grams of, of leaf tissue are we able to capture out of the canopy several, you know, apple, or X amount of days after application. And, you know, basically you can tell pretty quickly here Dinotefuron is moving into the plant very quickly, but you can also see how after 120 days it's starting to peter out pretty quickly. No offense, Peter. Um, so um, this is why we find this product is, is not ideal for applying in the springtime, because if you apply it in the springtime, it's petered out by, by, the, um, by the time we really need it up in the plant. But in, in contrary to that, you know, this is actually, you know, why this product is, is so valuable to us is this section right here, where um, it's hot, it's dry, tree injection can be quite slow at this time of year. It's too late in the year for us to apply imidacloprid because we're not going to get enough of the product up into the tree um, to, um, to effectively uh, um, stave off the larvae there. So this is really where dinotefuron sort of fills this gap in, in our management uh, cycle here. So um, out of the three products, this is probably the one that is probably number three on the list of most common products we use, but it absolutely has a, a spot in the toolbox for, for a couple of valuable reasons like that. A, the uh, labor savings with that uh, bark spray application and this treatment timing of being able to um, offer a service during a time where the other products aren't as effective. 
let's look at what this looks like in the real world. Um, this is from our Hazelcrest uh, trial, which we'll see some other slides from here in a minute. Um, but these were treated with the bark spray application. So this is a question we get a lot. It's like, well, I mean, it works in theory, but does it really work? work? Uh, and absolutely, you can see, um, especially when you compare it to the, uh, the, the untreated guys. So this would have been treated the fall before, and this would have been treated in spring. And um, so you can see it absolutely does have an um, a, a effect against uh, emerald ash borer when you start comparing it to the other dead trees in the neighborhood. So, um, so having all the, uh, the options in your toolbox uh, will definitely you know, be a nice factor once you get to a point where your communities are under this kind of pressure. You'll absolutely want to have multiple ways to, uh, to combat this issue. Here, if we actually look at, so branch sampling has really become the way that we do a lot of our both um, trial evaluations and also just sort of our um, census um, uh, sampling of, of where is the insect around. Is it here yet? It used to be just doing visual um, exams. Well, now we actually clip out uh, branches from the trees um, in random manners to, um, to, to peel back the bark and look if we see any signs of, of larval activity. So, Check on the top where you can see our untreated one. Look at this year. You can actually see back. This is some of last year's growth there. You can see significant larval damage in there. And then this is some from this year. You can see um, larvae in there. Where you really start to notice the difference is, is what we're trying to do with, with these insecticide treatments is, like I said, we're trying to get this product into the xylem because the, um, the, the, the larvae um, uh, engrave into the xylem as they're consuming the phloem, and this is what eventually will kill the tree by basically blocking the flow of water uh, up through the canopy, right? So what we're trying to do is basically protect that layer of xylem so the tree puts out a nice healthy layer of xylem, and that's exactly what you see here in this transect pick is, look, last year you can actually literally see in last year's growth ring, you can see larval activity. This year, because it's been under protection, the tree was able to put out one nice, very um, uh, good layer of a uh, uh, creamy, milky white xylem tissue that is conducting water for it just fine. So give this tree a few more years and you won't see any impact from, from, the, from the days of larval damage there. So like I said, this is actually, I mean, this is a great picture for TransTech here, but this is also what we, like I said, this is how we uh, do a lot of our um, uh, treatment evaluations to determine if whether or not the, uh, the treatments are really being effective. When we're looking at just how much insecticide is in the leaves, which is a common way to do these kind of studies, that doesn't really answer the question of whether or not it's, you know, if it all just accumulates in leaves, well, this is not a leaf problem. You know, emerald ash borer is consuming the vascular tissue, not the leaves. So, um, so now we really look at um, branch sampling as our way to, is, is a great metric for, for looking at the uh, effectiveness of these treatments. And this slide in particular is a great visual to sort of say what we're trying to do with these treatments, and you can really see the effect on the tree. Uh, the third uh, treatment option and product would be tree injection by uh, emamectin benzoate. The rates for this vary by, by tree size, um, so um, I don't have an easy uh, a rate to give you, but there are rate charts out there for these products. Um, no matter what type of application device you're using for, um, for tree injection, um, um, we always recommend doing, doing treatments uh, as far down as possible into the root flares. Ash don't have quite as defined root flare as some other species, but they absolutely still have, um, still have um, uh, you know, defined root flares. And part of the reason we do this is, you know, really look at um, the difference in, in how, how basically thick the xylem tissue is, or sapwood in this case, um, which is xylem. Um, when you go down lower. So basically the higher you go up, but another way, the thinner it's going to be. So if we go low, we get better product distribution by going into the root collar area here. It's thicker in the sapwood and basically, as I just said, that translates into um, more even distribution of this product throughout the canopy. So um, if you, you know, are interested in, in tree injection equipment. Um, obviously, you know, Rainbow Tree Care being a, a, a you know a tree care company as well as a, a product developer, we actually developed the, the you know we actually developed a whole suite called our IQ suite. Some of you may have seen, but um, this is not our uh, equipment talk. Uh, we're actually going to be covering more stuff in one of the later webinars. So if you're interested in equipment, I uh, highly recommend you attend those. But just as my you know two second commercial for our stuff is basically. 
we had to invent equipment that our crews couldn't break <laughs> when it comes down to it is so many of the other injection devices are really finicky they have small little knobs on them they have knobs that are difficult to tell if they're even on or off they have metal tips that are thin and bend so we actually worked with the USDA APHIS to develop a um, application system that uh, you know we could get um, 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 product into the tree. Our biggest factor was we absolutely did not want to have plastic plugs. Uh, they were an extra cost for us and they are an extra step in the application and really they're not there for the benefit of the tree. They are there to make up a, 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 a product design failure of the equipment. They're not there that the tree didn't need that, um, the, the application equipment needed that. So we looked at what was working about macro infusion, which we've been doing for 30 some years, what aspects we liked about current microinjection products, and basically took the best of both worlds and put them into a form factor that is uh, arborist proof, so our crews don't destroy these things. So, um, like I said, I'm not going to go too much more into the, the, the how on these, because um, I want to jump into some research stuff for our last few minutes, but um, I'll plug at the end the dates of these other upcoming webinars. So if you want to know more about the tree injection equipment, uh, my boy Chris Hogan will call, cover that in a, in a couple of weeks, and it'd be definitely worth attending. So, Let's jump into some of this research stuff. How much time I got here? All right, I got 10 minutes. Perfect time to, uh, to cover this stuff. So Hazelcrest has been a, a really interesting research site for a lot of reasons. You can see the different partners we worked with in, in setting up and in monitoring this trial. Um, Hazelcrest is a community on the outskirts of, of Chicago. Um, and um, we've been doing a, a fairly long-term study there that actually started in, I think, 2008, I want to say. Peter's not in, so I'm going to go 2008. Um, we actually have two distinct sites here, and what's really interesting is, is we'll see in a minute how the um, emerald ash borer pressure in these two different sites sort of determined. Uh, we learned a lot about, about application timing and rates and things and how um, uh, the insect population pressure really has an effect on those. So these are the two areas we're going to talk about, the Fountain Blue Drive and West Village Drive here. And, and this is basically how both sites sort of looked at the outset of this trial. Um, Fountain Blue, you can kind of see, remember I was showing you earlier how um, this sort of thinning canopy is sort of a telltale sign. It's not real distinct, but once you kind of learn an eye for it, it's pretty pretty apparent. Um, Fountain Blue is much further along uh, in their uh, in their starting EMB um, infestation than the second uh, uh, area was, and we'll see sort of how that impacts the uh, the, the the treatments. Um, uh, Fountain Blue, this area, you can kind of see every um, tree with a number on this map was part of our study, and it's probably tough to see on the uh, the legend over here, but we were looking at, um, kind of similar to what you saw in the Toledo study, we were looking at things from uh, treatment timing, uh, application rates, um, combining different applications. Um, so we, we did lots of different treatments where we combined one product with another product to see if we got better results from that than we would at just a standalone product. So this research trial was really pretty uh, all engrossing from all the different aspects that we covered. And um, let's start looking at some of the data for this. And a lot of how we saw in that, um, remember I was showing those slides from the, the uh, Toledo trials, we kind of saw the same thing, that during the time where the, the population was sort of building up, we didn't see a significant difference between any of the treatments, any of the timing, and really any of those treatments compared to the untreated. Now let's move out four years from the time that this study started, and we start getting to 2012 here, and you really start to see a separation, certainly a separation from the untreated trees, and you even start to see a separation within the um, Within the, uh, within the treatments, but the treatments are really basically tracking through this whole study. You can kind of see how even the treated trees, again, you can't see me pointing at my screen, maybe I should use my cursor instead of my fingers here. Yeah. Um, but what you start to notice is, is the trees, they still have some canopy decline occurring, right? So even trees that we've been treating for multiple years here still have um, some canopy decline more so than they did at the start of the study. And that's partly because, as I was saying earlier, this had a, a significant insect population present in this area. Um, and once it started to build up, remember, these are only looking at the untreated trees in our study. There is thousands of ash trees around this area. So our trees that are in the study, when we had a couple of dozen trees under each one of these treatment regimes, compare that to just the thousands of trees that are around there that are buzzing with, uh, with emerald ash borer, um, it was really hard for these, these treatments to, to 
you know, again, they don't, they're not repellents. So it wasn't, if you treated this tree, it stays at 0% uh, canopy decline. Um, you start to see how um, as the population builds up, even these treated trees start to have some damage. But when we look at what do these look like in real life, here is a shot of these exact trees in 2012. So this is exactly what we were just looking at on that chart. Look at some untreated trees versus a couple of these different treatments. And yes, we're getting canopy decline on these, but you know, to a, a, a typical homeowner, this is still you know, pretty acceptable uh, canopy on these trees. Let's look at where these trees are at two years after that. So this was just last summer. So notice on the chart, these trees really, even though the untreated trees have you know, continued to go exponentially until they're starting to run out of untreated trees, which is why the, the untreated tree, um, they're gonna be off this chart in a little bit, because pretty much every untreated tree is about to be removed in the next few years. But um, this is really where the, the, the significance of these treatments happen is now two years later, you know, all the untreated trees and even some of the, the, the less effective treatments are really starting to decline out and we still have quite a bit of um, uh, green in the canopy of these, of these treated trees. And remember I said fall time 1x imidacloprid was not our strongest treatment and you can actually start to see what that looks like in real life is, you know, we're still having insect feeding up there and so we might still be getting some, um, some canopy decline, but when you start comparing that to these untreated trees, it's pretty significant to show that even our worst performing treatment performs way better than not doing anything. Uh, let's look at, a, this is just down the road. Um, here's a, a springtime treatment of, of imidacloprid uh, and some untreated trees in the background in 2012. Um, and now when you look at this same tree two years later, um, all the untreated trees are gone, so you know compared to that. Um, but look, even this springtime, this is again the one X treatment. You know, it's still under this significant pressure, having some trouble um, fighting off every one of these guys. Um, but you know, if you know this was a, a homeowner's tree and every other tree on the block has been removed and they've only got a few dead branches to have to prune out it'd still be considered a success rate. Um, but like I said, this is actually some of our, our, our poor performing products still, when you look at them visually versus what the, the you know, doing nothing action uh, resulted in, it's, uh, it's still pretty significant. Let's take a, um, we'll go south of the highway and come check out the second research site, which is our, um, our uh, West River Drive one, or West Village Drive, sorry. Um, in this place, now notice how, um, the smaller um, uh, the population of the insects starting in 2008, by the time it's 2012, they actually were not nearly like, you know, on our last one, we saw the fountain blue trees, they were already up into that 50% canopy decline range for even our treated trees by 2012, right? So in this area, we had a much lower starting population and, but you'll also notice that not really, you know, by the time 2012 happens, the untreated trees are dying exponentially in here because the treatments were started when there was less um, uh, of a population to begin with. Um, the, the treatments held out quite a bit longer, but when we, you know, let's look at these in, in real life, let's look at some of the, here's our spring 2X treatment, even a spring down to Tefuron compared to an untreated tree here in 2012. These trees still look really good. You know, there's not even declined branches up in the canopy. They still look really impressive. Now, come 2014, you can start to see how this insect population is, is sort of cresting here, and it's starting to drag the, uh, the, the, the data of the, uh, of the treated trees even, although they're still significantly in better shape than the untreated trees. So if we check back in on these same trees two years later, our untreated trees are in significantly raggedier shape, uh, and our trees right across the uh, street from them. Now think how many thousands of insects have been emerging from, from these untreated trees here and likely looking for the closest ash trees to latch onto. And even in, in an area like this, these treatments are still holding on uh, significantly well. And this is just another, I think this is a Emmeck and Benzoate treated tree if I'm not incorrect there. Uh, but now look at this neighborhood in, in 2014. All the untreated trees, and this is again in two years ago, the untreated trees were, you know, in, in you know, they were declining, but they're all still alive. And just two years later, the, the impact is is palpable in, in this neighborhood of literally any tree that's not a treated ash tree and part of this study is going to be removed in the next few years. So our uh, our take home message would be, you know, go back to, you know, we've seen how how the, the insect population affects the the, the growth of this um, exponential death curve chart. Um, you know, 
this will sort of happen on its own whether you do anything or not. And the, the part that we can affect is, is as the number of dead trees goes up, the number of ways we can manage those trees goes down. So, um, you know, early um, detection, uh, early action, um, there's been a lot of questions of why the Minneapolis market hasn't exploded in sort of the same textbook way that some of the other markets have. And I just met a researcher from the University of Minnesota last week who said, he said his big three things are, A, it was discovered here early. You know, we discovered it in 2009 instead of 2012, and it didn't have, you know, a couple more years to, to spread from there. People got an action early, and that action included removing ash trees. It included um, companies like Rainbow and other companies in our market protecting ash trees, and also just the awareness factor of it is people are looking for it so much more now that it gets discovered much more quicker. And then the third thing is probably our weather and climate here in Minnesota might have some factor with the cold, um, but, you know, it was not very cold this winter, so I don't know how much that will hold. So, you know, the, the, the options... Um, uh, do go down exponentially as the number of uh, ash trees goes up, but um, you know there's absolutely still options even even in the the, the heart of the, the beast in some of these that we have for for protecting trees still. So I'll just do a quick recap before we uh, pull out here. Um, basically, remember we talked about we have three main products and. All, all treatment options have pros and cons. You know, our soil applications are quick and easy to apply, but they also have a slower uptake. And, of course, there's cons per acre issue with, with all pesticides we have to be concerned about. Um, Transtect has the ability to be able to be applied by that um, uh, bark spray option, has the ability to be a treatment that we can apply right in the growing season. Um, but its downside is it doesn't have as long of a treatment window uh, as the other treatments do. Uh, and mectin benzoate has the, uh, the pros of lasting for two years. Uh, we also get good results with therapeutic treatments with m mectin benzoate. Uh, its pros are, of course, it can protect um, in areas where we uh, don't even have the option to do uh, soil treatments. Um, but the downsides of it, of course, you are drilling the tree, and there is a tree wounding involved with that. And there's, of course, equipment that goes along with that as well. But so, um, you know, in closing, basically, you know, I was asked at the end of my talk I was given in South Dakota last week, Brandon, if uh, Emerald Ash Borer showed up here tomorrow, what would your recommendation be? And I said, show me the tree and we'll go from there. So, like I said, all of our management is focused on the at a tree level. So be thinking about that. Of the, There is no best overall anything. There's a what's the best for this tree at this time of year, and it might change the next year based on other parameters as well. So keep as many uh, options open to yourself uh, as possible. Uh, here's my plug for our upcoming webinars. Uh, let's see, we are now on this one here. Uh, which you just attended. So you can see upcoming, we've got some, uh, if any of those uh, topics look interesting to you. The one I was uh, plugging earlier was the uh, best management of tree injection, if you want to learn more about how the uh, application equipment works. Uh, if you like the uh, sultry sounds of my baritone voice, you can join the, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, plant healthcare toolboxes later on this week, which kind of touched on a little bit in this, but I'm also doing one on uh, apps and iPads and such uh, in a couple weeks. So uh, stay tuned and check some of that stuff out. So with that, I shall thank you, and I will try and open up my questions box and see if there are any questions to get to. All right. <laughs> What's up, Peter? Okay, to end on time. Okay, uh, Peter is letting me know that we are uh, out of time. Um, what I can do is uh, I can stay on, and I will actually I'll email uh, question answers to folks. That's what Peter is not an amazing to do. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time this morning. I see five or six questions here. I will uh, um, get those uh, to uh, to you guys as quick as possible here. Again, thank you so much for attending. My contact is on the screen. If you'd like to send me a follow up email or uh, questions or comments. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're here to help you guys. So with that, I will thank you. Uh, enjoy your day. Be safe out there, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks.